and we'd like to welcome you this morning to worship. In your pew, you'll find the red folder that we'd like you to fill out and pass along your pew so that we can register your attendance. In your bulletin, there are several announcements printed, a couple that we'd like to lift to your attention. You have um, a salmon colored, I call it, insert that one side tells you about the backpack program here, and they're doing their annual pledge. And so look at that. And then on the back side, we have teacher appreciation today for all of our helpers throughout the, um, throughout the school year. That could be Wednesday night helpers, Sunday helpers, anytime helpers. We have a lot of them. So look over those names as well. Um, VBS and camp signups are still happening. So if you haven't done that yet, make sure you see that table is back in the narthex. So you can take care of both of those things. Um, we'd love to have you participate in either, and I'm assuming they still need helpers for BBS. So if you're willing and able, they'd love to have you. Just stop by that table back there, and then Pastor Andy has an announcement for us as well. Last year, you'll remember that our Bishop, Bruce O, had challenged the entire conference to a $100,000 miracle offering. That is, all the churches together in their codas to bind together with an offering so that we could start a new ministry right in the heart of the oil fields of western North Dakota and Watford City. And last year, we did not raise $100,000 at an annual conference. We raised $270,000, was it, Pastor Murphy? It was an incredible, incredible day of celebration. And so the bishop has asked us to do it again this year. Only this time, the new church start will be up. It'll be a restart for three tiny little churches that are going to build together for one big, vital regional parish by Kenmare, North Dakota, Johnny Brook, Bow Bells, if any of that rings a bell, if you've ever spent time up on the Canada and aboard it there. And so the goal, again, is twofold. You'll have that insert inside your bulletin. The first is to raise $100,000 to start that new uh, ministry going. The second you'll see is a whole list of items because the people working up there don't have access to a lot of thrift store things. Take a look through that bulletin over the next two Sundays. We'll receive those offerings. Just mark your check, Bishop's Miracle Offering, or bring those items in. And between the three or four of us that are going to annual conference, we'll collect those items and haul them out to Rapid City so that they can send those on up to the oil fields. Thanks, Melissa. At this time, go ahead and stand back up and pass the peace with those around you. Good
was already in there. But I like it. I think we use it every Sunday. Therefore, since we have been made righteous through His faithfulness, combined with our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Made righteous through His faithfulness, combined with our faith, we're not entirely responsible. we got to move on. Please say this song to me. It talks about faithfulness all over again. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations.
Heavenly Father, glory and honor to your holy name. You are the way, you are truth, you are life. I pray that your grace and your mercy, your rivers of living water flow through your people here today. And I pray that that happens all week long. I ask, I ask you to help us see and experience your finished work already in us. Bless all here with every spiritual gift, every blessing. We seek your will, we seek your kingdom that grows in us. Help us to recognize that your powerful grace and your undeserved favor are with us all the time. We have all that we need in you. Help us to walk humbly with you day and night and always. We give you praise because we as believers Know that you've forgiven all our sins, past, and present, and future. Your sacrifice was enough. Your sacrifice was once and was for all. Thank you. Thank you for forgiving us. And we want to forgive those who have brought us. Help us to do that. We ask for your healing and guidance in all those relationships. Save us from self-righteousness. Save us from judging other people. Save us from judging ourselves. Today we thank you for the graduates. We ask that you would be with them, that we know you're with them. We ask that you guide them with your Holy Spirit. They, they, they would hear you. They would be conscious of you. We give you praise because you have promised that you are always with us. By your love, empower us to resist temptation. God, Quiet us to hear your Spirit's guidance when trouble is ahead. We will forever give you praise to you because you are the and I've always been the healer. We ask that you would increase faith, healing, grace, and peace to all these people. Michelle Beeson, Bert Hyatt, Shirley Hansen. I invite our younger boys and girls to come and join me up here as we sing together, This is Where Children Belong. This, this is where children belong. Welcome that's part of the worshiping throng. Water God's word, bread and cup, prayer and song. This is where children belong. Good morning, boys and girls. Hey, we've got a good group. Now, last night, did you have a good night's rest? 
Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Oh. Well, how many use a pillow when you sleep? How many use a pillow when you sleep? Okay. You know, there's some pillows that are hard and some pillows that are soft. I've got two pillows up here. You see them? One is soft and one is hard. Hard as a rock. Do you think you'd like to use that rock for a pillow? Yeah. No. <laughs> well, you know, in the Bible there's a story about a man named Jacob. He was leaving home and he had a long ways to go and he had to walk. So he couldn't take a lot of stuff with him. And this one night he is so tired and he just had to sleep out on the ground and he didn't have a pillow. He, knew he couldn't take a pillow with him. So he used a rock for a pillow. But you know, during that night, God spoke to him. God came to that man, Jacob, in a dream. And God told Jacob some things that Jacob needed to know about how much, how important he was to God, how God wanted him to follow him. And so that was such a life-changing dream an experience that when Jacob woke up in the morning, he took that rock that he used for a pillow. Now, that isn't the rock Jacob used, but it's one like it. But anyway, he took the pillow, that the rock that he used for a pillow, he put a pile of stones up, put that pillow rock right on top, poured some oil on it. That was part of his worship. And he made a promise to God. Boys and girls, did you know that God talks to boys and girls? God speaks to all of us, but he also speaks to boys and girls. How does God speak to boys and girls? Through the Bible. When you hear Bible stories, that's how God speaks to boys and girls. Through teachers. And you've got Sunday school teachers, you've got parents, you've got grandparents, you've got people that are in your life and they show you things. And a lot of them are so helpful. God talks to boys and girls through teachers. God talks to boys and girls through their own thoughts. You know, you can just all of a sudden some real good insight comes to you and you know God is speaking to you. And then sometimes God can speak to you through a dream. Don't forget the things God shows you. And if you're old enough to take, write notes on that, find a place to write them down so you'll never forget them. Because you see, Jacob put that stone up because he never wanted to forget what God told him that night. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you for these boys and girls, and I thank you that they are so special to you that you will show them things that you want them to know. Help them to know that it is God speaking to them, and help them to listen to what you tell them. Amen. Thank you for coming. And may I make a suggestion to parents and grandparents? Have you ever thought of having a journal for a child? You know, things that have come to you to pray for them. Insights you've had. Stories they have related to you. And keep a record to someday handing that to them. And let them know how God has intersected on their behalf through interesting ways and things. There we are. Good morning. I'm here today on behalf of the Children's Ministries Committee to honor and thank all of those who, who have helped us teach an adult, youth, or children's Sunday school class, helped with the Wednesday night fun activities, or led an adult study over the past year. You are all greatly appreciated, and this ministry wouldn't be possible without each of you. If you please take the colored insert out of your bulletin that Melissa referred to earlier, containing the list of those who have helped this past year. 
If your name is on this list, I would ask that you stand and remain standing while I read this poem in your honor. And I have the list. I can call you out. Stand on your own. <laughs> and if you helped and we missed you, please stand as well. Blessed are the Sunday School Teachers by Rhonda Barner. Blessed are the Sunday School Teachers who tell the children the truth about Jesus, for they will be called the teachers of God. Blessed are the Sunday School Teachers who love and hug the children, for they will be embraced by God's glory. Blessed are the Sunday School Teachers who endure the talkative children and the ear-piercing screams of the little girls, for they will hear God's joyful laughter among them. Blessed are the Sunday School Teachers who behave and play like the children around them, for they will receive youthful vigor for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Blessed are the Sunday School Teachers who listen to the children's concerns, for God will reveal his heart to them. Blessed are the Sunday School Teachers who teach the children to pray, for they will experience God's power through answered prayer. Blessed are the Sunday School Teachers who lead one of these children to saving grace through Jesus Christ, for they will have treasures in heaven. Blessed are the Sunday School Teachers who call on God for wisdom in teaching his word, for the Holy Spirit will speak the truth in love through them. Before you leave today, will you please take a flower as a small token of our appreciation for using your time and talents to teach and further God's kingdom. Let's give them a round of applause. In the history provided in the Old Testament book of Genesis, we meet Esau and Jacob, the twin sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac, the father, was the son of Abraham, through whose family God brought forth the people of Israel. Esau was the firstborn of the twin sons. The firstborn son inherited the right to follow his father as the leader of the clan with the resources needed to be the leader. Prior to the birth of the sons, the Lord had given a message to the mother that in life that role would be reversed and the older son would serve the younger son. Jacob, however, did not wait for God to perform God's intentions. Instead, using his deceptive skills, he stole the inheritance from his older brother. Esau vowed revenge. He would wait until the father died, and then he would kill Jacob. So Isaac and Rebekah, the parents, fearing for the safety of Jacob, sent him away to Rebekah's brother using the excuse that there he could find a wife who was of their own kind of people and of their own religious understanding. Today's scripture reading tells of Jacob on his journey from his home to that strange and faraway place. We encounter Jacob as he seeks to, put, to find rest in an open field in a very strange place. The scripture this morning is from Genesis 28, verses 10 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and sent out, set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put, under, put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There he, above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you, you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth.
Throughout history, people have used the hardness of stone to preserve things that they wanted to keep as a memorial. And we are certainly familiar with that here in this part of the country where the use of granite is such a common factor in the making of headstones that remind us of people that have lived in our presence here. And it's especially, it has especially been useful in keeping track of agreements relating to, or history of agreements, that is. Over in, by Corona, there's a lady who has spent a lot of her lifetime studying the history of the mystery of markings in stones on this side of the Coteau Hills. You can go through the fields and find a permanent rock someplace and there in that rock is a mysterious hole that is neatly bored. And to this day, they do not know what they necessarily stood for. But you see, the point is this. In history, the remembering of agreements has always been very, very important. In the biblical story of the man Jacob, Jacob's subtle and deceptive actions had caught up with him. He had stolen the inheritance from his brother Esau. He had, so he had been forced to leave the family home and to head for another country. And if we can have that map, we'll try and see a little bit of an idea of where he was going. But anyway, there we are. The Bible tells us that his family lived here in Beersheba, and he was on his way up there to Haran. And I'm not going to pronounce the other name because Pastor Andy uses a New England slur, and I use a Midwestern uh, type of vocabulary. <laughs> we have a different... Anyway, we'll call it Herod. But the point is this. That was a distance of about 500 to 550 miles that Jacob had to travel, and he didn't have a set of wheels, so he had to walk it. <laughs> and they, that night event that we meet Jacob here in the scripture that was read today, we find him enveloped in a deep loneliness. He just left the home where he probably would never see his father or mother alive again. He held the family fortune, but he could never use it. He did not know for sure where he was. He didn't know how to get where he was going. If he got where he was really intended to go, he didn't know if he would be received. And so as a result, in that desperate situation, enveloped by deep loneliness that night, he lay on the bare ground and used a rock for a pillow. But that night, Jacob had a God encounter. That night, God appeared to Jacob and called Jacob to an accounting of his life. Up to that point, Jacob evidently had seen life as his gift to use in the way he wanted to get the most out of life for himself. But that night, God began to break upon Jacob the idea that God had a purpose for his life. People, how do you view the purpose of our lives? Now today is a very important day for graduating seniors and their families because today represents the completion of one phase for these young people as they prepare themselves for what they have chosen to do or are aiming at in life. And so, but how do we prepare our students for this? Now, if we prepare them to be self-sufficient in making their way through life, that is a very meaningful endeavor. But in the accounting of God, is that enough? A decade ago, Pastor Rick Warren published a book that was so provocative that even the non-religious people were reading it, and it was a bestseller. But the name of the book was The Purpose Driven Life. And the underlying purpose of the book was to discover the answer to life's most important question, what on earth am I here for? The opening paragraph of chapter 1 reads like this. The purpose of your life is far greater than our own personal fulfillment. Your peace of mind and even your happiness 
It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by His purpose and for His purpose. Now, do we within the church community really believe that? Well, we should because it's so biblical, is it not? But if we do, then why do we as church communities and as church families have seemingly so little interest in our youth seriously considering God's purpose for their lives as we bring them up, give them an education? How many times after we get them to high school does it seem our big objective is to thrust them off into the secular university where they will be, where their spiritual values are likely to be greatly challenged, but we want them to learn how to make as much money as they can throughout their life so that in this brief span that they're going to live here on planet Earth, they will have a good income. And I'm here today to ask, is that's why so many students in our seminaries today are second career individuals. People that are midway through life because they had their own plans for life and they sought to endure them, to endeavor to find them, and yet life has been unfulfilling to them, and now they have stopped in mid-career and said, God, what do you want me to do? And their direction by God is very different from what their own directions were. Anyway, that night, lying on a bare ground with none of the comforts of home, immense in deep loneliness, Jacob encountered God. And Jacob took note of his God encounter. Listen to his own description. He said, this is an awesome place. This is none other than the house of God. And he was so profoundly immersed in it that he gave the place a new name. He called it Bethel, the house of God. And the significance of that event was so captivating too that the next morning he got up and he made a pile of stones and he took the stone that had been his pillow stone and he put it on top and he poured oil on it to signify that it represented a very sacred event. You see, Jacob had made, not only had he heard God, but he made a covenant with God. And to me, it was one of the first real smart things that Jacob had ever done in his life. And he determined not to forget it. And so the building of that, putting that, that stone on the top of a pile of stones was to be a memorial rock that was to remind him of what he had learned from God and what he had covenanted with God. People, do you and I have memorial rocks in the history of our lives? Do we have piles of stone that we have put up? Because we have had encounters with God. And maybe in those encounters we have even made covenants with God. If we do, what are some of the stories and the meanings that lie behind those memorial rocks in our personal history? Is there a chance that we would have a memorial rock in our history that takes us back to a personal encounter that we had with God? And maybe it was in a Sunday school class or a vacation Bible school event or in a church camp or a church service where we became aware that Jesus Christ had come because He came to be our personal Savior and every one of us needed that. And we put our faith in Him and invited Him into our lives. And there we said, we want Jesus Christ to live with us. Is there a chance that we have a memorial rock in our history that takes us back to a time when we were so caught up in the grandeur and the greatness of the world around us that we began to realize, we sensed a presence there that said, this world in which you live is far greater than you and your plans for your life. 
And it was like there was a calling to us to reach out beyond ourselves, to become a part of something that was much greater than us, that was related to the spiritual being that seemed to make all things real. Is there a spiritual rock in our history that relates to a crisis event? A time when either we ourselves or somebody that we really cared about needed a divine intervention and we went to God on their behalf. And maybe we even made a covenant with God. Maybe we even said, God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. In the library of our memories, where are the piles of stones? Where are the memory rocks pertaining to our encounters with God and maybe even covenants that we have made with God? Two weeks ago, Melissa Gall preached from this pulpit. And by the way, I asked her permission to refer to her. And I even asked her to tell it again. To, so I got it pretty close. And I think I do. But anyway, in her sermon two weeks ago, she told of her oh, parts of her own spiritual journey. And part of that journey was an encounter with God at a church camp where she believed that God was speaking to her about becoming involved in the life of the church for the purpose of serving the Lord. But as she moved from that place, that memory sort of faded and she began to think about other ways and eventually it led her to the college, to a college where she prepared for another very worthy occupation, the, peer, the, the occupation of education. And she became involved in that and was doing a good job. But along in her journey of life, she revisited a memorial rock. A rock that went back to that camp. And there she discovered that God had not forgotten. And God had not changed his mind. And Melissa did a very wise thing. She responded positively to a trip back to that memorial rock. And so she's with us today in a new vision. Here's what I'm asking. Is there a memorial rock in your life and in my life where we had an encounter with God, where maybe even we made a covenant with God that we ought to go back and revisit and consider again what transpired there between us and God? The next 20 years were life filled with a lot of adventure for Jacob. God indeed blessed him with family and prosperity. However, in Jacob's uncle Laban, Jacob met Jacob. And after 20 years of being lied to and cheated, Jacob had had enough. He had to move on. And God came again to Jacob at that time in a dream. And notice how God introduced himself. He said, I am the God of Bethel. Where you anointed a pillar and you made a vow to me. I'm that God, Jacob. Remember that pile of stones? Remember the one you put the pillow stone on the top? You poured oil on it so that you wouldn't forget. I'm that God. You know, there's a lot of things that transpired from that encounter with, between Jacob and God and what happened next. But we're going to skip some of that. We're going on to chapter 35 and we read, Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. And so 20 years had transpired. And Jacob had met God at Bethel. But in that 20 years, Jacob had seen God as kind of a fire department God. The kind of a God you kept around in case of an emergency. Or the kind of a God you kept around in case you needed his help to get you on with your plans of life. And I hear God saying to Jacob, Jacob, up to now, you and I have had a companionship relationship. But now, 
I want that to move to a higher level. I want to be the sovereign God that you will worship. I want you to find your whole purpose in life to be the purpose that I designed for your life because I want you to live, to serve me. And so he said, I want you to go back, back to Bethel, back to that memory rock. And I want you to take that memory rock and I want you to add a bunch of other rocks to it. And I want you to build an altar there that's going to be a part of your worship so that it will represent how you will come and bow before me as the great and almighty God. And your whole objective from this point on will be to live your life for me. You see, Jacob was beginning to discover what Pastor Rick Warren said when he said, you were born by God's purpose and for God's purpose. May I ask, what is the memorial rock in your life? Or the memorial rocks? Do you and I need to take a journey back to them? Like Jacob, do we need to go back and make some changes even to move on from just the encounter with God and take the covenant with God and make it into something where God becomes truly the God that we don't just use, but the God that we worship and the God that we serve. I have a little New Testament here. You can possibly see from there even that it's pretty ragged anymore. It's been worn and it's held together with tape. It's the old King James Version, you know. But this little book will stay with me as long as God lets me hang on to it because it has two memorial rocks in it. The first one is that my grandfather bought this for me when I was in grade school at a little bookstore at the Wilmot Camp Meeting. You see, my grandpa wanted me to know God. And he wanted me to follow God and to look for God's plan for my life. And he bought that and gave it to me. And you know there was something so significant about that that it has always been very special to me. Even in those years through grade school and high school when I was not really pursuing God like I should, I still hung on to this little testament, took it wherever I went, read from it, kind of trying to stay on the good side of this fire department God that I wanted to have on hand just in case of an emergency. But anyway, it took me back to the people in my life who loved God and I respected and wanted me to know that God. There's another rock, memorial rock that's kept in this book and that is in the flyleaf of this book. I have some dates written. I have there the date of my birth, so I wouldn't forget it. I have there a date that's it's, it's listed as June the 2nd, 1950. And that was a day when at the Wilmot Camp meeting again, I did intentionally open my life to Jesus Christ and ask him to come in. And it was definitely the beginning of a pilgrimage with God. Then there's another date, and that's October the 6th, 1956. That's six years difference there. But in that time, I had an encounter with God because I had an encounter with death. And when death was winning and life was slipping away and I was aware of it, I made a covenant with God that if he would save my life, I would give it to him. And God miraculously intervened, reversed the course of nature, saved my life. And for the next three years, I lived horrible life as I had the weight of that covenant over my head and I still kept thinking of what I wanted to do in my life. But you see, finally on October the 6th of 1956, exasperated and exhausted, I said to God, I quit. Wrestling with you 
From now on, you are the sovereign God of my life. To the best of my ability, I will follow you. And then there's one more date. And that is the date when I knelt at an old army bunk in my dorm room and I said to God, from this point on by faith, unless you show me clearly otherwise, I'm going to take by faith that you're calling me to be a minister. And that is what I'm after, to serve you in that way. You see, it's good for me to go back and look again at those memorial rocks, to be reminded of them, to be renew them in all of their meaning. You know, today is a good day for all of us to go back and visit some piles of stones in our lives, right? To look again at some of the memorial rocks that are in the history of our lives. Our encounters with God. Maybe our covenants with God. And kind of update them. See how we and God want to work at them. And maybe even move on from just an encounter with God. Where God is a very good companion with us and move on to where God is the God that we worship out of the very purpose of our lives. Amen. During this time, we have had these personal testimonies, and today we will hear one from Beth, Beth Jacobs. Does the road wind uphill all the way? Yes, to the very end. Will the journey take the whole long day from morn till night, my friend? Along the path I take, there are little white crosses, and now there is one more, since my husband Art went to be with Jesus last November 30th. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For when the sufferings of Christ overflow into our lives, so also through Christ his comfort overflows. Our biopsy in September really confirmed that the malignant tumors spread through his body, and at first I was in denial when we were told that the survival rate would be less than a year. I thought chemo would give us some quality time together. We could not have known that it would be only two more months. Psalm 31, 4 and 5. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. I knew God was not in heaven wondering what to do. Each day I walk with God, live in his presence, and acknowledge his faithfulness to me. At this point, every day became a new normal. It was overwhelming. Just overnight, small tasks such as cooking, cleaning, laundry, shopping, had to fit in to the appointments for doctors, chemotherapy, medicines, groceries. And in retrospect, God sent so much help to us, visitors, visitors food, and transportation when I needed it. For better or for worse, in sickness and in health. Art slept in his recliner and I on the sofa. God gave me the privilege of being his caregiver. He needed help getting ready for each day. Increasingly, more medication, and after the second and last chemo, he had lost his appetite. Food began to have a metallic taste. I felt like such a failure when he wouldn't eat, wouldn't and couldn't eat, and he was losing weight. When we finally started hospice, we received a hospital bed in the living room. I was so happy that he would sleep better now, but I also thought ahead to the day when the bed would no longer be needed and my precious husband would no longer be here. A bittersweet memory. Two family members were helping one day and also two boys doing community service, mowing and weeding. About 5 p.m. I thought, I should have some food for them. I was two steps away from the telephone when it rang. A friend called saying, I'm bringing the barbecue and some sandwiches now. And we had Boston green pie. 
and answered, answered prayer, and I haven't even asked. And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19. Even the smell of cooking oatmeal made him upset. Early 2 a.m., I was very hungry. I tripped out to the kitchen, opened a can of tuna bean very carefully, and to pour the liquid into the drain so there would be no odor. I had tuna salad and half a box of cooked spinach, a little piece, then back to sleep. When family, friends, and neighbors came, we felt blessed, and I could see Jesus in their eyes. Some came to visit, some to sing gospel songs, some brought food, or winterized the boat, or filled the school theater. There were a gaze of all our care for this homemade donut or cookie as someone walked past him. When art became too difficult for me to care for, he consented to go to the care center. I could again be his wife, and the nurses gave him around-the-clock care and the larger doses of medication that he needed. When he saw me the next morning, he reached for me with both arms, smiled, and called out, my wife, a precious memory. The fifth day, Pastor Andy, Katie, and James and Angus spent time there with Art's family. Later in the day, Pastor DeBurn was with us, and before he left at 9 p.m., he prayed and asked God to release him. I had told Art earlier that when Jesus took his hand, I would let go, and I did at 10.35 p.m. when Art went with Jesus. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, Psalm 116, 15. Now, again, every day is a, is a new normal. I walk with God, and his compassions are new every day. Great is his faithfulness. As we respond to God's word read, Claimed and testified to. Let us offer ourselves and our gifts and our tithes and our offerings back to God's purposes. <laughs>
realize that the God who made the universe would come and speak to you and me and give us an encounter. Don't be afraid of them. Matter of fact, go back and revisit them. Remind yourself of what it meant and what its purpose was. Amen. Say